Hello everybody. This is part two of a two-part series I'm doing on how God's holy days, tied into the harvest of Israel especially, uh, show us God's plan of salvation for all of us. A really remarkable thing. And uh, help us understand what he's, what he's doing. Now, if you can, try to watch part one. But even though I'm going to review all the way back to the beginning with this one, it will not be the same material that I covered in part one. So you could just start with this one too. When I was a little boy of about 12, uh, my family and I had moved to the United States from the Philippines, and we started to come and meet with people on special holy days. And it was later that we found that these days that are called holy days or feasts days are also called something else, divine appointments. Do you realize that God has set four of his divine appointments for you to meet with him in the rest of the calendar year. Three have already happened. Four more are yet to come in just the next couple weeks, as I give this in September 2023. Are you going to be ready to appear before your maker? Are you? And do you realize that these are appointments that you have with God? Have you thought of God's holy days? And that's what the Hebrew word really means. When we see the word feasts, one of the words is appointment. I'll talk more about it in a second. So welcome to Light on the Rock, everybody. I'm Philip Shields, host and founder of this website. And remember to check also for blogs, short articles, lots and lots of blogs. Learn to use the search bar, type in a word or two. Like if you're looking for Feast of Tabernacles, sermons or whatever, just type in tabernacles or tabernacles. There are some that have just the singular tabernacle. And, and you'll find all kinds of sermons. Passover, unleavened bread. Just type one or two or three words at most. The more words you put in, the more it confines it to the, that particular word, and you may miss some sermons. So remember to check all that out. And we have a mix of video sermons, audio sermons, and blogs. Anyway, today I'll focus on explaining how can we know we're still supposed to be keeping these days? What does each day mean? What's the point of it? What's the point of getting together on a Monday, a Wednesday, a Sunday, or whatever, Pentecost and that kind of thing? How do they reveal anything about God's nature, his plan to how and how he's going to go about saving humanity? And is God losing in the plan of salvation and his battle for souls? Is there a battle of souls even going on? And if there is a battle, is he really losing so badly as it appears he is to Satan? So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Plus, how do the harvests of Israel have anything to do with God's plan of salvation? I'll certainly be talking about that today. <clears throat> I'll also include links to sermons on each particular holy day that you can also go back and listen to very detailed sermons about Feast of Trumpets, Atonement, Tabernacles, and the Eighth Day. But let's get back to the appointments with God. The main reason most people uh, miss the idea of appointments is that the way the word for feast or festival, feasts, are transla is translated into English is feast, when there are two separate Hebrew words that are used for this. Uh, that, but they're both translated feast. When I hear feast, I think of, I think of uh, a lot of food, a lot of good drinks, and uh, fun time, a lot of people laughing, having a good time, celebrating something. But one of the two words for feast is that word, sameach, which I'll come back to. But the other word, moed in the singular, moedim in the plural, does not mean a party <laughs> with food and drink and all that. Moed, but it's still, a, it's still translated as feast. Moed means appointed time. The plural for Moed is Moedim for feasts. It's an appointment for a very specific time, a specific season, a specific date set by God in this case. It's a time when he's expecting us to show up. This is the word God uses for feast in the Hebrew Bible much of the time. Don't miss your appointment with God. Imagine having an appointment with an important person. Imagine having an appointment with God Most High. That's what the feast is. Now, is that all canceled? We don't have appointments with God anymore? Many teach that. So the first word is moed, meaning appointed time. Moedim in the plural. 
The other word is sameach, S-A-M-E-A-C-H. That's another word also translated feast. That one does more closely correspond with eating, drinking, having a fun time. And so um, the word C-H-A-G, it looks like chag, but it's chag, chag like that. Chag sameach means happy feast in Hebrew. It's their equivalent to us saying happy holidays. Now, God's holy days are holy, though. They're not just holidays, okay? Some argued with me that the root's the same, holiday, holy day, what's the difference? Well, I just like to call it a holy day. These days are holy, set apart for Almighty God. <clears throat> We're now in the New Covenant. Do we in the New Covenant still have to keep these Old Covenant, it looks like Old Covenant, holy days, feasts? Most of Christianity says just that. We, we don't keep these anymore. God's holy days are not to be kept in the New Covenant. So somehow God decided to cancel them all, his own days, his own appointments. And they claim that our Sabbath, they claim the same for the Sabbath day, and they claim now that our Sabbath rest is in Christ. Not in a day, it's not Sundays, not Saturdays, some say. It's always, every, all the time, resting in Christ. And they use Galatians 4.10 and Colossians 2.16 and 17 and other Romans 14 to teach that even now God hates his own Sabbath somehow. That it's Judaizing, that it's putting legalistic laws in front of us. And the casual reading of those verses might lead you to think the same thing. I was invited to speak at the Baptist uh, seminary, Baptist Bible school in Canada one time. And uh, after I gave my talk about how we are, who we are, and, the, the, and what we believe, one of the students there <clears throat> said in a very condescending voice, I thought, he said, Mr. Shields, I'm reading this in my Bible. Have you ever read this verse? And then he goes on to read it about months and days and years and so on. And so then I said, would you all please turn to Galatians 4.10 since he didn't tell you what he was reading. Yes, I know that verse. I know it very well. Let's talk about it. <laughs> he looked at me like total surprise. Galatians 4.10, I knew exactly what he was reading. But anyway, remember Leviticus 23 calls these feasts, these Moedim of the Lord. And the weekly Sabbath, in fact, which was also a feast of the Lord, or of Jehovah, uh, is one of the signs that he gave. I'll give you the scripture. I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures as I speak it, and also in my notes, that many of you who've been coming here for many years know these already. Uh, those, for those of you where this is somewhat new, I hope that you'll take the time to print this out or open it up on a computer or something and just read all these scriptures in your own Bible carefully yourself. Exodus 31, verses 12 to 17, God gave the Sabbath as a sign. It's a sign that you're my people. And the fact that the tribe of Judah, at least enough of them kept the Sabbath going on, we still know who the Jews are. The lost ten tribes gave up on the Sabbath. Now they're lost to humanity, though many of us believe that many of the Northwestern European countries, and American, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, are also remnants of the twelve tribes. But anyway, so read up on that. It's a, it, it, we, lost, we lost our sign. We don't know we're God's people. Eh, we, we do to a point, but that's going quickly now too. Anyway, one of the reasons God punished Israel so severely and sent them into captivity was because of the fact that they weren't keeping the Sabbaths, meaning the holy days, the weekly Sabbath, the land Sabbath, all of that. And I'll give you scriptures in Nehemiah 13. Um, Nehemiah 13, verse 16 and 17, Ezekiel 22, 26. Ezekiel 22, 26, it's all in the notes too. And this also explains why Nehemiah was so insistent that they keep the Sabbath. Hey, didn't we learn our lesson? It was kind of his message. So, um, and when people don't keep the holy day, something else happens. They get all messed up on their theology of what happens when we die. So now most of Christianity says that when anyone dies anywhere in the world, they are immediately, uh, their spirit, their soul, immediately goes to heaven or to hell to be tormented and tortured forever and ever by a loving God. They never quite die. 
the body died, but the spirit, the soul, gets forever to be tortured in a lot of pain, but never dying from it, in a place of torment. They never quite die. I remember in talking with different ones, I remember a pastor one time and I were talking about it, he was a Protestant pastor. <clears throat> and I asked him, why would there be a need for a resurrection if, if they've already gone to heaven or hell? Why would there need to be a new body if they've obviously got a new body in heaven already? And so uh, he didn't quite know how to answer that. And then I said, and why are we told that the wages of sin is death? Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is not eternal life, being tormented and tortured in hell fire by a loving God. No. In fact, Malachi 4, I think it's Malachi 4, around verse 2 or 3, it says that the um, ashes, and that the wicked will be ashes under the feet of the righteous. Malachi 4, I believe around verse 3. If they understood the holy days and the harvest seasons, they wouldn't be teaching you go to heaven or hell to be tortured or to live forever in heaven on a strumming a harp. you got to learn to play a harp, I guess. Where do these come from, right? <clears throat> For any of you who believe, who really believe, that the holy days are all canceled, I had another question. This one was for my one of my sisters. Um, who's really, really trying to convince me that we don't have to keep holy days, although she says their church recognizes the dates and that there is a holy day coming up. I don't believe they keep the holy day. And so I asked her this question. I haven't yet, I have yet to receive a good answer from anyone on this. If the holy days were all canceled, how is it that the Son of God didn't get the memo? Acts 1 verses 4 to 5, after his resurrection, being assembled together with them, he, this is Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you've heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be immersed, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So you've got to wait for it. If the holy days of God were canceled, or were supposed to be canceled, why on earth would Yeshua make his disciples wait? And why on earth would the new covenant church of God start on a holy day if they were all canceled? Why would God send such a confusing message? They're canceled, but I want you to keep it in order to receive the Holy Spirit. Makes no sense, doesn't it? Does it? So did Yeshua not get the memo, like I said, that Father had canceled? I think that's silly. So we read in Acts 2 that uh, when the day of Pentecost, that's a holy day called Feast of Weeks in the Old Testament, Shavuot in the, uh, Shavuot in the uh, Hebrew, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, because there was some question about where you start counting from, the weekly Sabbath or the holy day within the days of unleavened bread. And it's the weekly Sabbath that you start from, always. And that puts it a little bit later, usually, than the other one. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They showed up on a holy day. They didn't believe it was canceled. The Son of God said, wait. Wait so you can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then you can read the rest. The sound from heaven, the strong wind, the divided fires, tongues of fire on their head, and and uh, verse 4, and they were filled, Acts 2, verse 4, with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages, tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. In the New Covenant assembly of God's called out ones, they started the whole church on a holy day, on one of his appointments, one of his moedim, his moed, his appointed time of Pentecost. Surely if the Holy Day has been canceled, it would be a very confusing way to start a new covenant assembly of God. Church means assembly. A lot of, a lot of you don't like the word church. But anyway, I, I'm just saying the ecclesia, the called out ones. 
If that's not proof enough, Paul made an absolute point to be sure that they were keeping Passover and days of unleavened bread. He brings up the Passover in 1 Corinthians 6, I mean 5, verse 6 and 7 and 8. <clears throat> and then he repeats some instructions about the Lord's Supper, the Passover, 1 Corinthians 11. But anyway, here, it's clear that Paul, Paul was explaining, as John the Baptist did, that there goes the Lamb of God, that all the, the Passover lambs were pointing to, it, they, they were prophetically pointing to, yes, they prophetically pointed to the Lamb of God. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6 and 7, Your glory is not good. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Verse 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, not and for you are truly unleavened. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, I'm reading. Indeed, Christ, Christ, that means the anointed one, our Passover was sacrificed for us. Christ, our Passover. Therefore, let us keep the feast. He's referring here to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Right after the Passover. Eventually, all of the, uh, eventually the Jews began to call that whole season the Passover. That's in Ezekiel 45, verse 21. And Luke 22, verse 1, it tells you the same thing. So, now you, so Passover was definitely kept. I just read it, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8, in the days of unleavened bread. The first day and the last day of unleavened bread are holy days, are Moedim. Therefore, let us keep the Moed, the feast. Moed in Hebrew is not the Greek word here. Let us keep it. And then in the world tomorrow, it's really clear, in Zechariah 14, <clears throat> verses 16 to 18, that after that after Jehovah lands, and Jehovah being Christ in this case, because it's very clear the angel said in Acts 1, the same Jesus whom you've seen rising up will come back again to this very same spot. That's in Acts 1. That's around verse 10 or so. But anyway, you can find it there in Acts 1. But in Zechariah 14, he lands on the Mount of Olives that splits in two. I believe that that will happen on Feast of Trumpets, the return to the Mount of Olives but not the resurrection. So stay with me here. The resurrection comes before that. But in Zechariah 14, later on, it says, and once the kingdom of uh, the rulership of Christ, setting up the rulership, the kingdom of God's rulership over the earth for a thousand years, Zechariah 14 is very clear that God is going to insist that all the nations of the world come and worship him that they should come to the Feast of Tabernacles to worship the king. That's one of the big reasons we go to the feast, is to learn how to fear God and worship him and rejoice and have a good time with everybody uh, keeping God's holy days. Why is that? Why are we being told it's going to be kept after Christ returns if it's all annulled right now? So I hope I made my point. The New Covenant Church began on a holy day, and we're going to be keeping them in the world tomorrow. And also in, in the 1 Corinthians 5, uh, we're told, keep the feast. Now there's an order to those whom God is calling and deciding to work with right now. The general sense is God is trying so hard to save as many souls as he can, and some of you ministers are panicking because maybe your own brother or your father or somebody is not, has not accepted the Lord. And uh, they're very sick and you're afraid they're going to die and not, not ever uh, having been saved. And they're going to be burning in hell, tormented, not quite killed. That's your fear. Because you feel, and if you believe that, by the way, you feel, you must feel God is surely losing this battle against Satan. They're far more unconverted unsaved people around the world than there are saved people. 
So the holy days combined with the harvest of Israel actually show us that God is not trying to save all of humanity right now. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. There is an order to all of this. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 to 28. I want you to focus especially on verse 22. 1 Corinthians 15 20 to 28. Christ indeed has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He's the first one resurrected as spirit. First one. Not David, not Enoch, not Elijah. Okay? In fact, they're not in heaven. So I'm going to cover a sermon on heaven and hell. So I'll explain that then. But since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. This was Jesus. For as an Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each, verse 22, each in his own turn, each in his own order. First, Christ the first fruits. Since we're also called first fruits, we've often called Christ the first of the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. When he comes, finally land on the Mount of Olives, those who belong to him will be with him. It says all the saints with him, the angels and all the saints will be coming back with Christ on spirit white chargers. Angelic white chargers that they'll be riding. <clears throat> and then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father. After he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he, he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says everything, it's clear that God doesn't mean himself as well. He's put everything except God the Father under Jesus' feet. That's what he's saying. And so when he has done this and conquered all death and all rebellion, I'll explain that more as we go along today, then the Son himself, the Son himself, will be made subject to him who put everything under him. So God may be all in all. I'll talk more about that later in the sermon. Just remember, each in his own order, and Christ must reign here on the earth, until, until all rebellion is put down. And there is a rebellion against Christ. So there's an order. So not everyone's being saved right now, called right now. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 13, he said, uh, I speak in parables, lest they understand, unless they see. And then I've got to heal them. I've got to work. He says, now is not the time. Matthew 13, verses 11 to 17. Jesus says that. Now remember, also Acts 4, 12, there's no salvation under any other name but Jesus. And yet, how many billions and billions of people, even since Jesus came and left 2,000 years ago, how many billions of people have never even heard the name Jesus scattered around the world? Didn't know the true God. But there's no other way to be saved. Is God going to be unfair? Punish them forever and ever? If they never even had their minds open or had the opportunity to learn? And so that's why missionaries, my father was a missionary to the Philippines. That's why missionaries have been so urgent upon themselves and others. That we've got to save all these people. Otherwise, all these millions in this country are going to go to hell. Well, that's not quite right. So anyway, God is not calling everyone right now. The Passover season, spring, and early summer harvest of Israel was the smaller harvest out of the total harvest. The much bigger harvest is in the fall. The spring is the smaller harvest. And those of us who are being called to salvation now are called first fruits. James 1.18, we are a kind of first fruits. Paul referred to different people by name. They're the first fruits in Achaia. They're the first ones there. This is God's time for us. It's our order. It's the order of the sequence. He's opened our minds. We're part of the smaller spiritual harvest first. By the way, the term first fruits is never used regarding the fall holy days. It's never used regarding the fall harvest. It's used only in the spring and summer real aware of that. Jesus is the first of the first fruits. 
then we're the first fruits with him. Believe me, God is not going to lose any fight he goes into. He certainly is not in a fight with Satan, and he's not losing it. All right? Although it can seem God's losing if you want to believe the theory that everyone has to be saved right now or burn in hell. But the way most understand salvation, God is losing. He's not. Frankly, for most people, now is not the time for them to have their mind open. We don't know whom God's calling and working with and uh, opening their mind. So, yeah, we, we do try to... Uh, explain about God. We do want to make disciples of as many as we can, but they have to be called by God or else we're, uh, those people are not going to respond to us. They don't respond to God because you called them. They respond to God because God called them and then sent you to them. Now let's get into how the holy days really do reveal God's plan. The plan of salvation, saving sinful humanity, starts with the Passover. Passover day itself is not a holy day. The holy day begins the next day, the 15th of Abib, or Nisan. And of course, uh, it's about a new life. Abib means the greening ear. The, uh, it, it points to new, new, new life, new growth. Okay, That's what it points to. Nisan also has a point, a point, some say it points to flowers and different things. But anyway, it, it's new life in Christ. I covered that well, I think, in part one. And I'll give you the link to part one. But I'm going to cover some things here now about Passover that mostly I didn't cover before. But Passover, and, and the other thing about the Holy Days. The Holy Days explain the order of, of, of salvation. Each one in his own order, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. The holy days explain that. But they also, the holy days also always point to Yeshua, salvation, to Jesus. They always do. All of them do. And I'll show that as we go along. And so Passover, we have Christ is the Lamb of God. This was the Lamb that God presented to the earth. And salvation is only possible through him. Acts 4, verse 12. And nobody can come to God the Father except, I mean, to Jesus, except God the Father draw them. John 6, 44, and I'm going to read verse 65. Since everybody reads 44, I thought it'd be different. John 6, 65, and he said, Therefore, I've said to you, no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by my Father. John 6, 65. So don't panic if you have an uncle who's a drunk or a womanizer or something, or you have a sister who's a terrible thief, and you're thinking they're going to burn forever, they're going to suffer forever. They may not. God may not have called them yet, opened their eyes yet. And God probably is most likely not calling them. So don't worry about that. Do your best, sure, to disciple them. Do your best to tell them about Jesus, of course. But if you're not successful, don't feel like you're, what is wrong with me? They won't see what's so plain. If they don't see what's so plain, God hasn't opened their eyes yet. Passover's first is, is kept in the first month of God's calendar, and he made the first month Abib, A-B-I-B. -B. And uh, you can read that in Exodus 12, the first two or three verses. That this shall be the beginning of months for you. They had been keeping the beginning of months in, in the fall, the Rosh Hashanah, the that word's not actually even in the Bible, I don't believe. Uh, head of the year, Rosh Hashanah means head of the year. The head of the year, the first of the year, is Abiv, not, not um, Tishri, uh, which is the seventh month. It used to be, maybe, but not now. It's a time of green leaves, new life. It matches our April most of the time. And when the, some Jews came back from Israel to Babylon, they not only didn't call it Abib, God allowed it, they used a word they brought from Babylon that also means flowering, and I think it does anyway, Nisan, N-I-S-A-N. It's not Nissan, that's a Japanese car. Nisan is the correct pronunciation. So God made a beef, which is a name I like better, the first one God gave, the first month. It's the, uh, it's the true New Year, not, not Rosh Hashanah. Passover is kept on the 14th of Abib. Then the next day, starting that night, the Days of Unleavened Bread, the, remember all the Holy Days start the evening before at sundown and go to the following sundown. 
So Abib 15 is a holy day. Abib 21 is a holy day. And that usually falls in our April. We're called to have an, a holy assembly of believers on all the holy days. In Exodus 12 and 19, we see that God had chosen to work with one ragtag slave nation called Israel. Hardly the great of the world, which is what he's doing now in the new covenant. He's calling the people who are not so great, who are not so wise, who are not so powerful, not so smart. But in the new covenant, Paul tells us in Galatians 3, 26 to 28, that now there is no more Greek, no more Gentile, no more, no more Israelite and Gentile, Greek or Jew and all that, male or female. No, once we're in Christ, it's not, it's not by country anymore. And Paul repeatedly, repeatedly says things like that. Peter even says, 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10, we were once not a people, but now we're a royal priesthood, people of God. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10, it didn't matter who was reading that, Jew or Gentile, it applied. It was a small harvest, though. Jesus called his followers, my little flock, little flock, Luke 12, 32. So God Most High is not calling everybody just yet, just a few, that's the message of Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. And again, I want to say that eventually, that entire season, Passover, the first day of unleavened bread, all the way through the seventh, that whole season was eventually called the Passover. Please read it for yourself. In Ezekiel 45, 21, it says the Passover, a feast of seven days. So God just eventually had them all lump it all together into the name Passover. I'm not hearing that preached much, but it's true. And it's verified in Luke 22, 1. Now came the days of unleavened bread, which is also called Passover. Luke 22, verse 1. Acts 12, verses 3 and 4. Herod took Peter and, and, and James and, and was going to uh, kill them. Um, he was going to kill them, uh, but he wanted to wait till after the days of unleavened bread and Passover and all that. So in, 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 anyway, in our Gregorian calendars, the dates will differ from year to year. Please see what a glorious, wonderful calling you guys have to be called as the first resurrection people, first fruit. God has given us a calling. We've been invited to the wedding of the Lamb. We've been invited to be first fruits of God. We've been invited to be in the first resurrection. If you really understood that, you would be so excited. But who are we? Why would God even know I exist? 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 to 28, explain that that's the point, that God is showing the world what he can do, even with people like us. That's the point. So when we work with all those who will be in the world tomorrow and those who will be resurrected later on, we can say, look, if God can do great things with someone as dumb as I am, someone with lacking the abilities and the talents and the, and the great things that you can do, just imagine when we combine what you can do already with the Holy Spirit. Now you're going to have to give God the credit and, and look to him still. But yeah, look what God could do. All they have to see is look at you. Matthew 23, the certain king put on a wedding for his son. And he invited people to come to this wedding. Many of them said, no, I'm too busy. I've got land to check out, a yoke of oxen to check out, and a new wife to check out. So they didn't come. So they sent more out. They didn't want to come. Don't let that be our story. Respond to the call. I don't know how many times God will call us over and over and over again. If we keep rejecting it, I, I wouldn't bet a plug nickel on that. Okay? If we do accept it, then God sends us to Yeshua to work with us, and God leads us to repentance. God leads us to repentance, Romans 2.4 which is turning from our sins and turning to Him. We are then baptized. We're immersed in a watery grave, burying the old self. And we come up in the resurrection of Christ, picturing that. And then we have hands laid on us so we can receive God's very Spirit, which we're told is His very divine nature, part of Himself, part of the way He is, the way He thinks, His mind. 
his nature, his power, his seed, his presence. We have to cultivate that. We have to exercise it. We have to not grieve God's spirit because the spirit actually is Christ in many ways. 2 Corinthians 3.17, the Lord is the spirit. Please hear my sermons on who or what is the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.17, I think a lot of us end up making our own trinity when we call the Holy Spirit it, separate. It's separate somehow from God over there. Be careful about that. Please hear my sermon on it at this website. Just type in Holy Spirit. This picture is how we're being saved and have been saved by grace. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For you have been saved. The Bible says have been saved, are being saved, and shall be saved if we endure to the end. God sees the end from the beginning and has promised that he will finish what he's completed, what he started in us. He will complete what he started in us. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. So we're created to do good works, though, in verse 10. Now, all of these days also point to Jesus Christ. He is our Yeshua. He is our salvation. That's what Yeshua, Jesus, means. I'll tell you again, the sound, the verbiage the, uh, of, of Jesus, the word Jesus didn't come into being for hundreds and hundreds of years. They said Jesus in the Greek and that sort of thing, Yeshua in the Hebrew. Unleavened bread as well. Pictures him. Unleavened bread is not picturing us. Unleavened bread is bread that's never been leavened before. Still is unleavened. Can't be leavened once it's baked. That doesn't describe us. We have been sinners. We can still sin. So when we take in unleavened bread, it's not showing how good we're becoming, as some teach, have taught. Unleavened bread is showing how good and perfect Jesus is. And we take him inside of us as we eat unleavened bread all seven days of the days of unleavened bread. We've been leavened. We've been sinful. Can't be us. Christ is now our life. Galatians 2.20 Then, right after Passover, soon after Passover, usually right in the middle of days of unleavened bread, we have something very special, a very happy day called Wave Sheaf Day. This one definitely points to Jesus, points to his resurrection. And then on the first day of the week, he ascended to heaven to be accepted in our behalf as the wave sheaf. Look up the word wave sheaf. Make it one word, wave sheaf, in my search bar to learn all about it. It's a very, very exciting day, very exciting day. And then we count 50 days to Pentecost, Shavuot which means weeks. Shavuot means weeks. Pentecost means 50. I don't think it means count 50, but has more to do with 50, which usually puts us into late May or to June in our calendars. This is a transition day of things that have already happened and a prophetic day of things that likely are to happen on Pentecost. On this day, Acts 2, I already read it. God sent his very precious Holy Spirit his presence, his seed, his power, his presence. If you believe in me, my Father and abide in me, my Father and I, Yeshua said in John 14, 23, Yeshua said, my Father and I will come and make you our abode, will come and make our abode within you. It's exactly what they did. That's what they're doing with the Holy Spirit. So God, it's the presence of God. And God gave the Torah, the Ten Commandments, all at that time, the codified Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai on this day. Now, Exodus 19, verse 1 and 2 says, it was in the third month since they left Egypt that all this happened, Exodus 19 and 20. Pentecost is called the day of first fruits. It's about first fruits. The word first fruits is not applied to any other holy day. First fruits are not all the fruits, just the first. The rest will be called later. But first fruits, the day of first fruits is today, Pentecost. This is so important to grasp this so you understand what I'm about to say. They were offered up 
on Pentecost, to leavened loaves. We read about that in Leviticus 23, 17, which are first fruits, which is us, which are first fruits to the Lord. On Pentecost, are raised up towards heaven. And then eventually the priest brought his hand back down again. Please understand what I'm saying. I really, really believe. Well, let's say this first. The first resurrection, which many believe happens on the Feast of Trumpets because it's got the word trumpet in there. Remember, trumpets were blown on all the holy days, Numbers 10 tells us. The first resurrection, which happens when the seventh trumpet is blown and Christ comes for his bride, we read that in the middle of Matthew 24, is all about first fruits. First resurrection is about first fruits. Those are the ones being harvested. Passover season, Pentecost, make up the first harvest of God. The rest of God's harvest, spiritually, is pictured by the fall holy days. Now, let's look at the first resurrection. At the end of Revelation 19, first of all, in the middle, in the beginning of Revelation 19, we're told about the wedding of the Lamb. In heaven. It says, I heard a voice in heaven. And they're there in heaven. And blessed are those who are called to the wedding of the Lamb. The bride has made herself ready. And then at some point, the Lord of Lords, the Word of God, it says it's the Word of God in the middle of Revelation 19, gets on his white charger and on his thigh is written, Word of God. Who's the Word of God? We know that's Jesus. And he's going to come back with his saints and angels. And they meet in, in the end of Revelation 19, a vast array of armies from all nations gathered around Jerusalem to fight him. And he wipes them out. The way he wipes them out is described in Zechariah 9, uh, 14. Zechariah 14, around verse 12, 13, okay? Look it up. So they're defeated. And the beast and the false prophet, political and religious leader, are put into the lake of fire. They're going to be burned up in the lake of fire. And then we come to Revelation 20. Satan is bound. The first thing you want to do is get rid of the troublemakers. Satan is bound. There is nothing said in Revelation 20 about any sins being put on his head. Many assume that, that that happens at that time. Nothing is said there. He's simply bound and put in a bottomless pit for 1,000 years. And then verses 4 to 6 of Revelation 20. Revelation 20. I'll post this as I'm talking about it. Be reading it. I saw thrones and they who sat on them. Judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Christ, to Jesus, and for the word of God. They didn't worship the beast. They didn't bow down to it. They didn't receive the mark. Okay. And they, I have it in bold, and they lived and reigned with Christ, with the anointed one, for a thousand years. I take that literally. There are more and more who are saying that's not a literal thousand years. Well, let's just take the Bible for what it says. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. The rest of the dead are going to live again, apparently. Okay? And they're not already alive in hell. They're not already alive in, in heaven. <laughs> okay? Okay, so he's saying that these thrones and judgment and those who are there, it says... This is the first resurrection for those who are reigning with Christ for a thousand years. Read verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has a part in the first resurrection. Now, when I say this is my first house, this is my first pet, this is my first, do I dare say wife? I don't want to, I'm teasing, but or if I say it's my first son or my first child, you would assume that by saying first, that I'm alluding to the possibility of having other children, having other homes or whatever. Blessed, okay, as he was in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. It's given to men all to die once. After this, the judgment, right? Hebrews says that. 
If you're in the first resurrection, you're never going to die. It has no power over you. Over such, the second death has no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign, royal priesthood. They shall be priests of God, teaching God's word, God's laws, and shall reign with him a thousand years. You want to be in the first resurrection or second or third or what? The first resurrection people are co-reign, co-reigning with Christ. We already know David's going to be over Israel. We already know that the 12 apostles will be over each tribe. Somewhere in all of that mix, you will be told what your assignment is. And it'll be perfect for you. And so those in the first resurrection, whenever it'll be, can never die again. Because 1 Corinthians 15, and just look up verse 53 and 54, it says, This mortal must put on immortality. We must never die again. When we're in the first resurrection, we're made spirit, immortal beings. Okay? This flesh must put on spirit. Okay? Now, since Pentecost is all about the first fruits, it makes far more sense to me for Pentecost to be the first resurrection when the first resurrection takes place. And I've been teaching this for many, many years. And more and more are beginning to see it. You can't have a first resurrection of first fruits happening in the fall season when the first fruits are never mentioned in the fall. And the first fruits is a small harvest. The fall is a big harvest. You might want to hear my sermon, I go prepare a place for you. It goes into a lot of detail, showing much, much more than I have time for right now. Having the feast of the first resurrection, the feast of trumpets, is putting the wrong harvest time at the wrong set of people. The feast of trumpets is not about first fruits. Pentecost is. It's called the day of first fruits, the feast of first fruits. It's called that. Now, we always assumed that first resurrection would have to be on the Feast of Trumpets because the word trumpets is there. I've already said trumpets is mentioned and blown on all the holy days, Numbers 10. By having the Feast uh, of Pentecost be when the first resurrection takes place also allows about three months for the seven last plagues to happen. See, if we're resurrected at the last trump, assuming that's the seventh trump, after the seventh trump, there are still seven last plagues, which you can read about in Revelation 16. It takes time to go through them. One of the plagues, I think it's the sixth one, I think, is the drying up of the Euphrates and all these millions of people coming across the dried up Euphrates. It's going to take time. So, what I believe happens, see my sermons, the wedding of the lamb, marriage of the lamb, I think it's called wedding of the lamb, actually, and the, also the sermon, I go prepare a place for you, like it says in John 14. It will explain that so well for you, okay? There's no more fitting venue for a wedding than on a sea of glass up in heaven. Most people believe that somehow we're hovering over Jerusalem all that time, waiting for months, waiting for the armies to come that we're supposed to get rid of, that Christ is supposed to get rid of. No, they're not there yet. And we have something to do. So we're taken to heaven to show the place that he's prepared for us. You'll be shown your own home in a city the size of half the United States. One city. You'll be, have a chance to meet Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Sarah, and Ruth, and all these people who will be there, and the apostles, and a chance to meet Yeshua, and God the Father. Yes, fathers like to see their children when they're born. And then we'll have a magnificent wedding, such as the world's never been, never seen. Such as there's never been, I mean. So the meaning of Pentecost is fully explained in my sermon uh, called the fivefold meaning, exciting fivefold meaning of Pentecost. Uh, I have a link to it in my notes. Just click on that. It'll take you there. Now, 
The first three holy days are done. The last four all fit in the seventh month of God's calendar. The seventh month. September. Sept means seven, I think. October means eight and so on. But then they changed our calendars. Anyway, so we come to the seventh month of God's calendar. The first day of the seventh month is Yom Teruah. Yom means day and Teruah means blasts. Day of blasts. Many assume those blasts mean trumpet blasts, and they could. But it also means shouting and screaming and praising and cheering, clapping, noise making. That's what it means. Why is that going on? Well, because on the seventh month of God's calendar, finally the earth will be freed. Like I said on Pentecost, I really believe on Pentecost we're being resurrected, taken to heaven. Yeah, we get to go to heaven. Go back and read Revelation 14 and 15, the first five or six verses, and you'll see the 144,000 are before the throne, before the 24 elders, the four living creatures. In chapter 15, they're on the sea of glass. Brethren, that's in, why did I almost think Canada? <laughs> that's not in Canada. That's in heaven. That's in heaven. While we're in heaven, we come to Revelation 19, and we get married. And then we come back on the super white chargers, angelic beings, back to earth with Christ at some point. And I believe that next point of coming back to earth, landing on the Mount of Olives, is most likely in my mind going to happen on Yom Teruah. It's going to be a day of such dark clouds and gloominess from war and volcanic ash, eruptions, volcanic eruptions, and um, nuclear war and everything else going on. You won't be able to see the moon and the stars and sun for quite a while. Even figure out which, which day it will be. There'll be EMPs going off, which will really blow up all our capability to have internet and cell phones. We won't know what time of day it was or anything. It's the unknowable day. Day of clouds and gloominess, Joel says. I think it's Joel. It says that. Yom Teruah. Day of blast because finally Jews will see that their Messiah really was Yeshua, is Yeshua, and he's come back to Jerusalem to save them. You can read all that in Zechariah 14. And yet, the, as, far, as far as being very specific about what this day means and what happens on this day, less is said about the Feast of Trumpets than any other day, any other holy day. And, um, but I think Zechariah 14 is very likely to happen on Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. Now this year, Yom Teruah falls on a Saturday. It's a double Sabbath, weekly Sabbath and a holy day, September 16, 16th of September, 2023. Jews will be keeping it for two days, 16 and 17. I guess the Bible just says one day, but they want to be sure, so they do it. Those who keep the projected, uh, in, uh, anticipated first sliver of light in Jerusalem, we'll be keeping it on the 17th, if they get to see the sliver of light on the end of the 16th. If they don't, I don't know what they're going to do. It's part of the problem with that, is if it's raining or cloudy or hazy real bad, you may never see that sliver of light. And remember, a new moon in Bible terms is not the dark of the moon, like the West has it. In Genesis 1.14, it says that God gave us these moons and stars and sun. These are, are lights. And the original Hebrew, it says, for your seasons, for your holy day festival seasons. The lights, not the darks, for whatever that's worth to you. So now trumpets has come and gone. We're on the earth. Satan is bound. Now we come to the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur, or in the plural, Yom Kippurim. Because there are many things that are covered on this day. I cover that in my sermon. It's called the Wonderful Day of Atonement. Because it's wonderful, because on this day there was the Jubilee. Land went back to the people uh, that was taken from or bought from. Slaves were freed. Debts were canceled. And freedom. It's about freedom. So on the Day of Atonement, I recommend you hear that sermon I have in my notes. It explains it in so much detail than I have anywhere begin to have the time for right now. Revelation 5, verse 9 and 10, out of the NIV. 
We are now on the earth, remember. We've been married to Christ. We now have come back. We've landed on the Mount of Olives. We're now in Jerusalem. Not in heaven. We're on earth. Revelation 5, verse 9 and 10 in the NIV. I'm going to read it this, in this case. The NIV is more accurate than the King James and New King James, where it says uh, in, in the King James, uh, it, it says uh, us in, in, instead of them, as you'll, you'll see. Revelation 5, verse 9 and 10, NIV. And they sang a new song. Who's singing now? It's the four living creatures, the 24 elders. They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. They're talking about Yeshua, the Lamb. And with your blood, you purchased men. You redeemed men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them, the people who were redeemed, you have made them, and it should say them, not us. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. On the earth. They will reign on the earth. I say that because we have some Seventh-day Adventist friends who will be listening to this. This is a very important verse. Among many, we can show that after the uh, resurrection, it's not all just done up in heaven. It's we come back down to earth here. The Day of Atonement is a day of full fasting. Totally no work at all, except one person who worked so hard that day, the high priest, who pictured just Jesus Christ. He did all the work of atoning, absolutely all of it. Everybody else was to stay, stay in their tents. Observe what they could. Much of this was happening behind the, the wall, if you will, wall of curtains around the tabernacle. They didn't see much. But they knew that there, was a, there were animals, there were lambs, there were sheep, there were bulls, there, were, there was a goat all being killed, blood being splashed around and so on, sprinkled around. But anyway, the one who worked very hard, it's, it's hard work to kill an animal. I found it hard enough to kill a, to, to, to kill chickens, although that was quick. Then you had to put them in boiling water and pull out all the, pull it so the feathers came out easily. At least that's the way we did it when I was growing up as a child. Anyway, so um, more is said about the Day of Atonement than any other holy day. If you want to read up on it yourself, go back and read Leviticus 16, all of it, and Leviticus 23, verses 26 to 32. It talks about animal sacrifices. We no longer sacrifice animals because we have Jesus sacrificed. There are two goats that are mentioned, besides the lambs and the sheep, I mean, and the, and the bulls. There are two goats offered to God on atonement. One is killed, sacrificed, and his blood sprinkled on the holy place and on the altar outside, cleansing it all from the sins and iniquities of Israel. There was a second goat, that's not even mentioned in the book of Hebrews when it talks about all this. And yet, in the Church of God groups, the bulk of the sermon seems to be about this goat, and they get it wrong most of the time, instead of the other goat and the blood being sprinkled and cleansing us from all sin. The second, the, the, both goats were an offering, it says that earlier in Leviticus 16, where does it say that? Around verse 6 or 7, you'll see that the, these two goats were a sin offering for God in their own different way. One was killed as a sin offering, and the other one was also offered to God. They both were perfectly fine goats, no blemishes, nothing wrong with them. And all the sins of the nation, the high priest came and put his hands on the head of the goat, the second goat, and he proclaimed on this goat all the sins of the entire nation transferring them symbolically to this goat. And then a fit man took it out to the wilderness, far, far away. Just like Psalm 103 says, Psalm 103, is it verse 12, that says that he's taken our sins as far as east as from the west, okay, and, and very, very far away. And so all this pictures Christ also. Definitely cannot picture Satan. This Azazel goat, Azazel should never be capitalized because it's not a person. It means departure, goat of departure. 
this is also goat, not even mentioned in the book of Hebrews about this. Uh, it's called scapegoat in the English, a terrible word. It's not a scapegoat. But many teach that this Azazel goat, upon whom all the sins of the nation are placed, represents Satan. Brethren, please, I hope you open your eyes to this. That can't be true. Satan has no part in atoning anyone or anything. What a shame to speak of him atoning for anyone, anything. Not a single scripture can be shown me or anyone because it's not there. That proves a single sin is ever placed on Satan's head for him to carry, for him to atone for. Not a single one. Not a single verse, not a single sin, not a single time. There are many verses that say all of our sins are placed on someone. And that someone, again, remember I said all these holy days point to Yeshua, salvation. When we accept him as our savior and him alone, all our sins are put on him alone. Nobody else. Nobody else. Let me read some verses. We'll start popping these up on the screen. Read ahead if you like. Isaiah 53, verse 6, in the bold print, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned every one to his own way. Yehovah, the Lord has laid on him, the suffering servant, picturing Christ, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 11, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge, my, ser my righteous servant. That's not Satan. My righteous servant shall justify, make good again, make righteous again shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. You might cross-reference that with 2 Corinthians 5.21. It's not in my notes. That he who knew no sin, that can only be Christ, became sin for us. That we, and we might say who know, knew no righteousness, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He shall bear their iniquities. He becomes our righteousness. Okay? He says, I have a swap for you. You give me all that you have, all of your sins, and I will give you my righteousness. Yes, we are gifted with God's righteousness. Just read the last few verses of Romans 3 and Romans 4, Romans 4, verse 20, 21, 22. Read those. Read the last few verses of Romans 9. And Romans 5, the whole chapter, we have a gift of God that we just don't talk about in the churches of God. We have a gift of His righteousness. His righteousness. That we have to accept. I want the best God can do, which is perfect. Not the best I can do and be like Paul who said he still sinned from time to time. And who shall deliver me from this body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Right? Now, notice these verses that I'll list. And it's always Jesus who bears all of our sins, not Satan. I don't have time to read every word in all of these, so be, be reading ahead. 1 Peter 3.18, Christ suffered once for sins. 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins on his own body, on the tree. Himself bore our sins, not Satan. Hebrews 9, verse 28, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Would be all if all would accept him. Matthew 20, 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Unlike Christ, who is also God and sinless and can, and can accept sins and become sin for us, like it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he can accept our sins, atone for them, accept it himself, and so therefore he has to pay the penalty of our sins, which was death, which is what he did on the cross. That's why he died on a cross. That's why he had to die, to pay for our sins. To pay for our sins. Satan can't do that. He has too much guilt of his own to take on any more sins. 
So the atoning for the sins of the nation. I believe now we're in the new covenant. It's not just the nation of Israel God's working with anymore. We know that in Galatians 3, 26 to 28, that no more Gentile, no more Jew, no more barbarian and so on. We're, we're all one in Christ and heirs of the promises made to Abraham, it says. So I believe that the Feast of Atonement, there's some speculation with this, but I, I, I think I'm right, that it pictures God reconciling, forgiving with the rest of the world at this time, saying, look, you guys, come, feet, come keep my Feast of Tabernacles. It's coming up here real soon. And next year and the year after, and I will bless you. And if you don't, I'm sorry, but the weather will act all funny. You won't get any rain. But I want to reconcile with you. And they'll start seeing the blessings on Israel and other countries that do obey. And the people and nations that don't obey will want what they have, will want blessings. And so over time, he's not going to force anybody to repent. He's not going to force anybody. He will tell them, if you don't repent, there will be penalties. If you do repent, there will be blessings. It's up to you. And repent means turn back to me, keep my ways, keep my way of life, keep my laws. And trust me, live in me, have faith in me. Okay? So the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the other goat, sprinkles it around on the mercy seat and so on. And that was a sin offering. It pictures Christ doing that. So we're cleansed also by the blood of the Lamb. And again, on this day, such a beautiful day, a jubilee, all of that, okay? So that's Day of Atonement, Day of Fasting. We're supposed to not eat, I believe, not drink either. Uh, whether you drink or not, uh, some don't believe they have to not drink. Some believe they can drink. I don't know that the Bible is clear that it says don't drink or eat. It just says fast. Uh, afflict your souls. It's actually what it says. Afflict your souls. If any of you are on medications that require you to safely take the medication with food, some maybe take a small amount of food and just, if it comes up, just say, well, I'm still afflicted, but it was unsafe. Please trust me on that. Uh, God is very compassionate and understanding. Go ahead and if need be, say you heard it from Philip Shields and I'll have to deal with it if I was wrong. I don't think I'm wrong though. If you really need to eat to take your medication safely, and it's not safe for you to fast for your health conditions, please hear me on this. Do the best you can, but eat a little bit if you have to. Someone out there saying, oh no, heresy. <laughs> no, I'm not. Okay, I know, I know my God. I know what he would allow. The Feast of Tabernacles is next. Okay, the Day of Atonement is the 10th day of Tishri, the 7th month. The first day of atonement, I mean, the first day of Tishri is trumpets. The 10th day is day of atonement. Now we come to the, it's the 15th day, I believe, is the uh, first day of tabernacles. Um, anyway, so the spring holy days show the first hurly harvest, the small harvest. In the fall, we now have the great harvest of God. All that fruit, all those olives and being pressed into olive oil and the vineyards and the wine and all the fruits and all the vegetables. And they bring up even the, it says, even those of your threshing floor. There's nothing threshed in the fall. So it's talking about bring, go ahead, bring the harvest even from the spring. Let's be thankful and grateful for all of it all year long. I didn't seen that before, but I, I, I saw that in something being explained. That it was a thanksgiving and a praising and a celebration of all the bounty God's given them. And so anyway, the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles is a holy day. And that's the 30th of September in 2023. It'll be a different day in other years, if you're listening to this in other years. And then the eighth day, the day after the Feast of Tabernacles is finished, is the final holy day. The eighth day is all I call it. It is not the last great day. The last great day is the last day of the feast. And I'll tell you a second why I believe it's called the last great day. But anyway, if you want to hear sermons about Feast of Tabernacles from me, from this site, just type in Feast of Tabernacles or just Tabernacles. And even type in just Tabernacle, singular, Tabernacle. Because there's a sermon called God's Desire to Tabernacle with Mankind uh, that I gave years ago at the feast. And I think, you, 
I think you'll enjoy it. We believe the Feast of Tabernacles, seven-day Feast of Tabernacles, pictures a thousand-year millennial rule of Christ on the earth. And it's going to take time to change this world. It's going to be devastated in the beginning. You know, you see the devastation from earthquakes and volcanoes and hurricanes, hurricanes, <laughs> hurricanes, and um, fire and different things. Think of the whole world looking like that, not just a city or two. It's going to take time to rebuild, change it. And you'll be there in the middle of it all helping people. Someone says, I can't find my son. You will, with the powers you will have, be able to find that son if he's alive. And bring that son or daughter to, to their mom. And unite families. Protect them from evildoers. You'll be able to show them the way and how to live. You'll be a perfect example. You'll be activating God's Spirit in you, Christ in you. The Feast of Tabernacles points to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. It points to the Savior, saving everyone still alive. If they'll listen to him, accept it. This is the start of the big harvest of souls and goes on for a while. Hence, we have seven days. It goes on perfectly, helping us around, helping people around the world, led by our leader, Jesus. He might assign you, hey, I want you to go to Kenya, the old Kenya, the old, <laughs> and, and go and preach to them over there. Go, go over to New Zealand, go over to South Africa, go to Colombia, and you will be able to be there in the blink of an eye. That's what spirits can do. You'll be able to walk through walls and, and, and doors and, and, and have miracles, multiply food, multiply fish and loaves, and have your own miracles. You'll be able to do all these things and more and, they, and, and build their confidence in you and in the leader we have in Jerusalem. And the world will now be ruled by servant leaders, starting with Jesus Christ. I've not come to be served, but to serve. And so will my followers, he would say. So we have to learn that now in our own families, at our workplaces, wherever we are, 24-7, we learn to lead. If we're called to be a leader, like a husband, like a father, you still have to lead, but you're going to do it in a servant way, in a humble way. Philippians 2, verses 3 to 5, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Imagine that. Let each of you look out for not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I get so frustrated by the hypocrisy of the leadership we have all around the world now. They keep, they keep putting rules on us, but they don't follow them. They're subject to corruption. So we have to change, and we have to learn to be the kind of leaders God wants us to be. On the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the last day of the feast is the seventh day. I think we read, I, 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 I've come to see this differently than I may have preached it years ago. What I'm about to read, I used to think was eighth day. I think this is the seventh day, the end of the seventh day. Otherwise, why would it be a great day? The last day of the feast, um, after the thousand years is up, Revelation 20, verse 7 to 10, Satan is let loose, and that is again so that people who've grown up without him, that thousand years, will now be tested. Are you really, really sold on my way, or are you not? Many of them are not sold. Satan hasn't learned anything. He goes about to deceive all the nations and brings them up against Jerusalem. They went up to the breadth of the earth, verse 9, and surrounded the camp of the saints. And the beloved city. I'm wondering if this is, might, have, might be happening around the Feast of Tabernacles. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So God the Father is looking after for us. And he sends down fire from heaven. How dare you attack my children, he says. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone with a beast and the false prophet. The word R is not in the Greek and will be tormented day and night. Satan is the one tormented day and night. The word they there is not in the Greek, and they will be tormented. No, it's not there. 
So what it's really saying is Satan's cast into the same lake of fire the beast and false prophet were and will be tormented day and night. That's talking about Satan. What follows next is probably the also a big part of the last great day. Revelation 20, 11. Then I saw a great, a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Now what happens? Okay, remember, all the rebels are dead. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Standing before God. And books were opened. The Greek here for books is biblion. Same word that we use for Bible. The, the Bible simply means the books, okay? The holy books, the holy Bible. Maybe you didn't know that. But here the Bible, the books are opened to these people. It wasn't open to them before. They weren't called before. Their mind wasn't open before. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. It wasn't open to them before. You can't just write your own name in there. God has to call you and work with you and give you the Holy Spirit, convert you, and then your, then your name gets in there. The dead were judged according to their works by the things written in the books. So they probably have some time to show God that they want to go his way or not. And at some point there will be a judgment. Do you want to be in the book of life or not? Then verse 13 seems to be the next stage. Remember Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6, speaks of, I don't have this in my notes, but speaks of those who once tasted the heavenly gift and who knew what was to come in prophecy. They understood the word of God. They had been converted. And then for some reason, they let it all go. They gave it all up and they walked away from God knowing what they were doing. Blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And it's not a good ending for them. Go back and read Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6. Okay? This, I think it refers to these people who are going to be, who are going to have to be judged guilty and because they refuse to come under the death penalty of Christ for them, they will have to die for their own sins. They all died already, the natural death that is common to all. But now they're resurrected to be judged and to receive the penalty of unrepented sin, I believe. The sea gave up the dead and all who were in it. And death and Hades, the grave, delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. So they were put to death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You might have heard how Jesus spoke at the Feast of Tabernacles in John 7, 37 to 39. And that has traditionally been called, the eighth day has traditionally been called the last great day, but it, it can't be. I, go to my sermon, just type in last great day. And the sermon will pop up. I'm sure it will. Last great day. Which day is the last great day? So let's read it on John 7, 37 to 39. On the last day, that great day of the feast. It's still called the great day of the feast in Judaism. Day 7 of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's called, day, it's called the last great day. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. Okay, My point is, what day would that be? We're told in Leviticus 23 that verses 39 to 44 that there are seven days. There are seven days in the Feast of Tabernacles. And in my sermon on which day is the last great day, I give many verses that talk about a feast of seven days. So the last day of a seven-day feast is, duh, come on, the seventh day, right? It's not the eighth day. That's a separate feast. 
It's not part of the feast. We kind of lump them together. We go to the Feast of Tabernacles, then we have the eight-day holy day service. But it's a separate holy day. So the Feast of Tabernacles, the millennium, is about everything finally being sorted out, the final harvest, people converted to God, the big harvest. Everyone is now a spirit being and would have to be. Or how are you going to survive when the fire will devour the heavens and the earth? There'll be no more heaven, no more earth, but a new heaven and earth. How are you going to survive that if you're not spirit being? So we're all spirit being at that point or burned up in the lake of fire. The final holy day. I'm sorry it's taking so long, but it's a lot to cover. The final holy day is the eighth day. Revelation, I mean Leviticus, I mean Leviticus 23, 35 to 36. This is the final holy day. It's not the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a standalone festival, standalone feast. It's the eighth day. This is not the last great day of the feast. What happens and what's the meaning of the, of the eighth day? We are not told. God wants to leave a little bit for us to wonder about. We do know there's a verse that says, and of his kingdom and his government, there shall be no end. Okay? No end to it. So whatever all that means, I think he's going to gather us all around and billions of us now, children of God, part of his divine family. He's going to say, you, you probably are all wondering, what do we do next? And before that, by the way, is when Jesus had turned over everything finally to God the Father, the beginning of the eighth day. Eight is the number of new beginnings. Okay, the new beginnings. The eighth day is eight in the ark. They began a new world. The eighth son of Jesse began a new kingdom of Israel, of Judah, uh, David. Little infant boys show their part of the covenant in the old covenant by being circumcised on the eighth day. We don't circumcise today in the flesh to fulfill any covenantal agreement. We don't. You can, if you want to, uh, circumcise your boys, but not for covenantal reasons. Go back and read Galatians 5, if you question me on that. Galatians 5, verses 1, 2, and 3, and 4. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing circumcision to be right with God, you have made Christ of no effect, it says. Don't do that. So what will happen after the new heavens and the new earth? Well, first of all, we'll see that Christ will bow down before God the Father, and all billions of us will at that point. The first resurrection is pretty small, but the, when, when finally everybody's given a chance to go God's way and their minds are opened, there'll be billions of us in the family of God. And that, that, uh, that promotes God. That makes him even greater. So, um, so you see, what will be his plan? I can conjecture, but I'm out of time already. But it's a good excuse not to stop, you see. But we still do keep the Sabbath. I think it's interesting. You go back to Genesis, I mean, to, to uh, Acts 13 and Acts 14 and Acts 17. Even when talking to Gentiles who begged Paul, we want to hear more from you. The Jews didn't, but the Gentiles did. Gentiles are so much more willing to hear from God's word than, than Israelites are. Paul doesn't say, hey, we don't have to wait till next Sabbath. In one of those passages, Acts 13, 14, and 17. But they do wait till next Sabbath. And Paul preaches again. Why didn't he just say, you know what? You're Gentiles. You don't have to keep the Sabbath. Our rest is in Yeshua. And so I'll talk to you tomorrow. He doesn't. Perfect opportunity to do so, but he doesn't. So we still keep the Sabbath. And, and the New Covenant Church started on a holy day, Pentecost. And Paul taught the Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread. And, and, and we know the Feast of Tabernacles will be kept in the millennium. So we know we have to keep it. And it all points to Jesus Christ as well, who then hands over everything to God the Father. And from that time on, we're pointing to God the Father completely. Atonement is definitely about Christ. God help us, not Satan. Feast of Tabernacles is about us ruling with him as king of kings over all the earth. When it says king of kings, he doesn't mean he's going to be king of all the earthly kings out there. They're gone. The other kings he's ruling over will be us. Will be David, who's king over Israel. I imagine Abraham might be second in command to God, to Christ on earth, I mean. 
And under Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be David, I think, over, the Bible says that, over Israel. And maybe over the Gentiles, I'm just speculating here, maybe Daniel, maybe Paul assisting him. Who knows? But it's going to be very exciting to watch, okay? And we'll reign with him a thousand years, focused on him, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And the eight days focused on Jesus handing everything over and bows before his Father until all billions of us will as well at that point to the Father. And we see a new heavens, new earth. Wow, I can't wait to watch that. Don't lose this. Be excited about it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Master. Hallelujah, Father. Let's dismiss. Ask God's dismissal. Holy Father, Holy Righteous Father, thank you for being our Father. Thank you for letting us be called by you now. Help us wake up that this is an exciting thing to be called now, not taken for granted. I know we all fall into that, just taking it for granted. Forgive us of that. And help us rekindle this fire within us. Please. The first love we used to have, the zeal that we need to have, not be like Laodiceans. Please, dear God. Yeshua, come live in us. Be dynamic in our lives. Help us in times of temptation to resist, to win, to be victorious. Like you always were. Help us be the kind of people you want us to be as fathers, as husbands, as mothers, as, as granddaughters and grandsons. Whatever we are listening to this, help us all to be like this, like you want us to be. We commit this now to you. We look forward to your holy days. Thank you for your holy days. We praise you. We glorify you. We lift up our hands to you, raise our hands like a little child running to his daddy, waiting to be picked up. We do that now. We praise you and we love you. Thank you for all you've done. Watch over us as we get ready for the feast. Protect us. Be there with us. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Father, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.